Good morning. It's so good to see everyone again, and we're so thankful that you have been studying with us uh, through this series in uh, Second, First, and Second Peter. Uh, we continue today with Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine, and Peter is going into some very interesting topics that a lot of people have a lot to say about, and we're going to try to get as far as we can this morning with this study. Uh, before we begin, Tommy, could you lead us in a word of prayer? Holy Father, thank you so much for this day and for the blessings you give us. We are grateful for this opportunity to study. The things, Lord, that we're going to be talking about today are things that many, many people are interested in because, Lord, I, I'm convinced that a lot of folks want to know when you're coming back. They want to find some nugget somewhere that's going to tell them the exact time and hour and, and day. And Father, we know that in your wisdom, you didn't give that to us. We know in your wisdom that you want us to always be prepared. We know in your wisdom, Father, that there will be those that will try to repent at the last moment and still be able to make it to heaven. Father, we pray that we live every day in fervent expectation of your coming. We pray, Father, that we would be ready every day of our lives in fervent expectation of your coming. And Father, we can get so bogged down in all these things and everybody's opinions about things to the point to where we don't know who to believe, much like what we're going through in the world today. But we do know this, you promise to return. You keep your promises. And Lord, that is enough for us. Help us to be faithful, be with us in this time of study. And Father, let us challenge one another and encourage one another day by day to be ready when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, kind of as a review of what we've been talking about, again, he has spent this entire chapter, or actually this entire book, to remind them, to stir up their pure minds by reminding them. Uh, uh, Dwayne brought out last, in our last study, he calls them beloved on numerous occasions. So here's a congregation that he loves very, very much. And one of the things that we also pointed out is that Paul or Peter here in this place is always giving reminders. We all need reminders because we forget, because we fail to keep on doing what we need to be doing. And so he reminds them that there's going to be a day where a lot of scoffers are going to say, in essence, well, where's the promise of his coming? And, you know, that's been from the very beginning until now. There are still those that are going to deny that Jesus exists, that God exists. And they're going to say, well, there's no proof of their existence. And we reminded of the fact of, and here's the biblical answer to this, that God has already destroyed this world once. And he, we talked about the idea back in chapter two, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And in all of those situations, he's always has those that are being faithful, even in light of what everybody else is doing and what everybody else is saying won't happen there are always those that are being faithful. And I think that's what he's trying to really emphasize to these brethren and something that we need to remember. And he says, <clears throat> this world had been destroyed once. And then as we come into this idea, he says, forget not this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And we ended this last class on that idea by talking about the idea that God does not count time like we do. God is eternal. And so you know, think about the idea of everything he's saying in the context of this passage. There are those that are saying, well, the longer God puts off his coming, then the less likely he is to accomplish it. Number one, they forget that he's God. God is not going to forget, and God still has the power to accomplish what he wants done. We may sit back and say, well, and we may take it easy. And the problem is with that is that sometimes we, <clears throat> we don't know when we're going to pass away. Many of us may pass away before the Lord's return. It may be another thousand years before he does. If that's the case, we have to be ready in our understanding. You know, man sometimes may forget his promise. Not God. When God's made a promise, he's going to keep it. Sometimes men make promises and then violate it and simply refuse to do what we promised to do. Not God. 
He will always do what he said he's going to do. And then sometimes we may make a promise in good faith thinking, okay, we will do this, but something happens and we can't. Something comes up. We run out of money or whatever it is that we promised in that respect will cause us not to be able to perform it. Not with God. God's going to make sure he takes care of everything in that respect. And so it's that ideal in mind. We go on into chapter three at verse nine. Dwayne, you want to hold ahead and pick up there? Yes. Yeah, so chapter three, verse nine says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise and as some count slackness, but as long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When we think about this idea of the Lord not being slack, the delay of God's judgment is not due to slackness. It really is his long suffering toward his people. And time does not limit God in any way, as you said a few minutes ago. God is not on a timetable as we are. We watch the clock every hour on the hour because we're so busy and there's so many things that we're trying to do, but God's not limited by a clock. But his promises never come too late. His promises will be on time. Um, when we studied last week, someone suggested maybe we do a study on all the promises that God has given us. Good, bad, and indifferent. That would probably be a lifelong study to, to look at every promise God has given us. But as it, it comes to the day of the Lord and the second advent of Christ, God's not slacking that promise. We have so many references in the Bible. We can go to Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. The Bible says, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Just as God told them, it happened. It's the same, it's no different than looking at creation. God said it and it was done. There was no in between, no slackness about it. When Jeremiah prophesied that Judah would be expelled from the land and held captive in Babylon for 70 years, that's Jeremiah 25, 11 to 12, the fulfillment of that prophecy took place precisely at the end of the 70 years of captivity. So again, God's promises, are, they never come late. He's not slacking what he's going to do. Time does not limit him. Now, what's our attitude about that? That's, that then becomes the question. What is our attitude about it? And so Paul says in, in Romans chapter 13, 11 through 14, knowing the time that now it is high time to wake, to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at end. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust. Now, when we think about, and we're going to talk about this in a few more verses here, when we think about what we should be doing, if God's not slacking his promises, what should be doing? Paul says, let us walk properly. Let us not route reverie in our drunkenness, not in our lewdness and our lust. These are all the descriptions that Peter called the mockers that we just went over a few weeks ago, right? They were all about themselves. They were fulfilling the lust of their flesh and not really fulfilling the laws of Christ. Now, Paul brings out this idea about walking in the light and being proper in the day. And Peter brought this up a few chapters ago as well about working in the day. Paul will also bring up in other chapters, we should walk and work as we have the time. That's, 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 that's been given to us. But what is really key here is God's long suffering also. Mm -hmm. He is so patient with the unjust group of people, if God just judged us on our actions and he didn't have patience and long suffering for us, we would all be in a heap of trouble. Uh, one commentary I found and made this comment long ago, Augustine said, God is patient because he is eternal. He who is from everlasting to everlasting can afford the wait. There would be, there would appear to be another reason for God's delay. Evident in the next part of the verse, God's patience toward us and toward his elect. 
So Tommy, I'll, I'll stop for a second, take a breath, let you jump in and give some thoughts there. And that's, that's, that's the key thing he's emphasizing. I think that's a big word there. It's long suffering. Mm-hmm. Again, the Greek suggests that he's long nosed. He, he, he looks past a lot of things. And that's the reason why over and over and over again, you see, how long was it that, uh, how long did it take Noah to build the ark? Uh, you know, we, we say that, you know, it was probably 120 years. We don't know exactly how long it was, but he was a preacher of righteousness that whole time. Again, how long, and I appreciate the fact that you brought out that it was 430 years from the time that they had entered the land of Egypt to the time that they had actually been delivered. And no doubt the children of Israel were sitting there all this time saying, well, where's the promise of his coming? You know, year after year after year, when's God going to come and deliver us? And, and it goes on and on and on. If you look again through the rest of the Old Testament, you see that God's long suffering caused him not to destroy the children of Israel time after time after time after time that he, he had been so patient when they're even worshiping idol gods in the temple, as is recorded in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, um, whenever they actually had turned their back on God and was engaged in all kind of, yeah, God's long suffering is it. And again, I appreciate Peter telling us why. Because he's not willing that any should perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Mm-hmm. But, and, and we've got to remember this. Here's the reason why God waits so long. He's bringing us that all should come to repentance. God does not have to change about anything. Sometimes the scriptures will use the idea that God repented, especially the King James Version. But it's not so much that God repented of what uh, he was going to do. As much as it goes on with that ultimate will of God, he maybe changed his ideas or changed his thoughts in the fact that, okay, I'm going to give them a little bit longer, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. And a lot of that is based upon our reaction to him. I I think about the idea that he wants us to repent and we have to be the ones that change. He gives us all this extra opportunity to change. And we've got one or two options here. We've got the option of either a going ahead and making that change and getting in the right relationship with God or B putting it off thinking we still have more and more and more time, but we don't ever have that. And you see, that's, that's, that's the way it is. Romans chapter 11, and I hope that, I don't know if Dwayne's going to get back in there or not, but Romans chapter 11 uh, also emphasizes this idea of how long God put up with the Jews. He kind of summarizes it there in Romans chapter 11, and, and he emphasizes to them, and he's writing not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, but he talks about the idea in this entire chapter about how God uh, saved them. He he rejected them, but their rejection is not final. He emphasizes that the Gentiles could not sit back and say, aha, we finally got the Jews beat. Now he says, no, listen, if you do like they did, if you become like they did, if you go down that same track, you too will be lost. Mm-hmm. And so in both of those situations, he's, he is really doing all he can to get us to change so that we will be ready when he comes again. God wants all men to be saved. And to me, this is another one of those very important passages that emphasize that some people are wrong in that he says, there is a doctrine out there. And again, this false doctrine that says God has chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. And whether you are the saved or the lost, you can't do nothing about it either which way. And this passage emphasizes to me, God wants all men saved. The choice now is ours. Mm -hmm. And so I did not have Romans 11, but you brought something to mind. It just brings up Matthew 28, right? God Mm -hmm. desires all men to be saved, but then he also gave us a commission to -hmm. share the gospel so that all men can be saved. Amen. And come to a repentance. And that idea of repentance is, you know, some struggle over that idea, but that idea is simply to turn away 
to turn away from the things that we were doing that was contrary or enmity, brings separation between us and God, to turn away from those things. And Peter, Peter talked about those things. I talked about what Paul said in Romans 13, you know, living for the flesh, uh, living for the physical. Uh, we're worried too much about, and we'll talk about this here, you know, in the day of the Lord, the things that are here, we're concerned more about the things that are here instead of thinking about eternal things. That's as right. Paul would talk about in Romans 8. You know, he starts out in Romans 8 and goes to Romans 8, talking about it several times about living carnally versus living, you know, in the spirit. And living carnally is death, but living in the spirit is everlasting life. And so we, we get tangled, we get trapped into these things of the world. Uh, and that's not what God has called us to do. But then Peter goes on and say, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And so when we think about this idea of a thief, Paul used this figure um, in 2 Thessalonians 5.2. It's also used in Revelations chapter 3, uh, verses 3, verses 16. Um, it's also used in, in Matthew 24. It's first used in Matthew 24 by the Lord as he talks about uh, the second coming. And in Thessalonians, you know, the bars from reading, you know, more than 10 verses, uh, Thessalonians 5, 2, the Bible says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And again, when we think about this idea of a thief, a thief is coming not to be seen. A thief is coming not to be announced. No one knows. Uh, a thief doesn't really uh, have a lot of success if he's if he's warning the signal bell before he comes and so when christ comes he's not given a a warning you know christ in, in matthew chapter 24 he says we do not know the day or the hour uh, matthew chapter 24 verse 36 but of the day and the hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven but my father only but as the days of noah were so also will the coming of the lord man be for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in the marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away. That's a message to us. We don't know. How are we going to be living our lives but as, as we are awaiting the day of the Lord? And when we go through this idea of a deep, I think about how we how uh, we go out and we purchase alarm systems, we purchase security cameras, we're always on watch, right? And we're, and we're trying to be prepared. There was a time people didn't lock doors. Now we have several locks on our doors. Mm -hmm. And we have camera systems that see at the front door. And to, to that point, we don't have to answer the door anymore. We don't want to because we can see who's there. But we, we spend a lot of time watching. And we have Bible verses that says, be sober, be watchful. How are we living our lives as we are preparing for the day of the Lord? And Tommy, there's so much to say about that. Before I go any further in that verse, I'm going to give you a chance to say something. And again, everything you're saying is so true. And you know, I just reinforce and agree with what you're saying because you are making these very, very, very valid points. Now, John chapter 5, 28, 29, Jesus will say, do not marvel as this, the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave, all who are in the grave, mm -hmm. will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And so he, he, he's emphasizing again that God the Father has given him the authority to execute judgment. And because of his willingness, I think, to be so submissive to the Father that he was willing to die on the cross of Calvary for every person. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of that is tied together. And it's, he emphasizes in John five that he will be the ultimate judge. Mm -hmm. And that's an encouraging thing. And it's also a, a disconcerting thing because, you know, it would be hard for me on the day of judgment if I lived a, a wicked life, but I, even if I didn't live a wicked life, if I lived a pretty good life, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd heard the gospel and then refused it, or I became a Christian even so, and, and then after a while, I just walked away. It would be hard for me to look at those nail-scarred hands and that nail-scarred side 
and try to come up with some excuse as to why I treated, and this again, what Paul and the Hebrew writer and others will bring out, I treated the blood of the covenant as an unworthy thing. I don't, I don't want to be on that part. Again, I appreciate the idea that you brought out that he's coming as a thief, the suddenness of it. That's again, what's first Thessalonians five verse two. In fact, uh, a little bit later on this morning, we're going to be talking about first Thessalonians four, where Paul begins to really start getting into that. And, and it's another one of those, and you've heard me say this so often, it's another one of those sad tragedies where they broke the chapter in the wrong place. <laughs> if they're going to break it, they seem to break it up earlier in chapter four, not in chapter five, but that's, that's the place. Now we get into the details of it. You start talking about the idea of him coming as a thief in the night. And then we start talking about, ah, all right, what does this look like? Well, the heavens shall melt away with a great noise and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat. We can only try to imagine in our mind what that's going to be like. The Bible uses the word heavens in three different terms. Number one, the place where God dwells. And that's, you know, that's in, a, in that place where he talks about bringing us to be with him. The second way it's used is the idea of <clears throat> the heavens like we have today, where we have the thunderstorms and the birds fly and, and everything like that. So when he's talking about the heavens here, he's talking about the physical earth. He's talking about it passing away with a great noise. And he emphasizes then that this is the visible portion of the universe immediately above us in which the birds are going to fly. And he says it's going to happen with a great noise. Well, exactly how does he, does he emphasize this? And again, First Thessalonians will talk a lot about this idea um, with the idea of uh, trumpet sounding, with the idea of the archangel sounding, with the idea of all of this happening. And again, there's not going to be a person on the face of this planet that will not know what it is who it is and what it's all about. And so I can't again, even begin to imagine a trumpet blast that the whole world hears. I can't even begin to imagine what it's going to be like whenever the, the heavens, these earthly heavens are parted and we, we see angels descending and we see all of these events beginning to actually take place. Uh, <clears throat> This great noise, you know, comes with the idea. It's a term that suggests the idea of the whizzing of an arrow, the rush of wings, the sound of the wind. And it's not just the sound of a nice, calm day. This is a sound of a, and some of us have heard that, the sound of a tornado. Only multiply that times 100,000. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just it. And then you think about the elements. What would that be? hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all those things that we learn in school that are the very basic building blocks of, of life itself. All of that's going to be gone, every bit of it, dissolved. And then all of those works are going to be burned up. And man, burning a lot of times is used with that idea. We, we know it talks about the idea of the hell fire from the King James Version. Uh, from a Greek word, which means the place of the dead. Uh, but there's also some phrases, some Greek phrases that actually would talk about this ideal of hell being a place of torment, as in Tartarus, uh, where the angels were. And so the bottom line is, is, this is where we get the ideal of punishment as in fire. And again, I, I can't even begin, or nor do I even want to begin to imagine what that's going to be like. We've already talked about this in previous lessons. And so again, all of this is going to be consumed. The heat uh, that's going to come from this fire is going to burn it all up. And then we have everything dissolved. So trees, houses, all this stuff we put our importance in, it's all going to be gone. It's just going to be gone. And then all that's going to be left is our souls and God. And wow. I, I, that's mind staggering, but it's also, I wonder sometimes if Peter was able to describe it in a way 
that they and we could even begin to imagine it. I don't know that you can describe something that cataclysmic. Wayne? So just wanted to touch on a few things. I totally agree. And some of the notes I have are matching yours word for word. Uh, I'm going to take a shot at pronouncing the original word for heavens here is Aranos. Um, and it had the three different meanings. It had the atmosphere, using Matthew 6, 26, the birds of the air. Right. Uh, as the sun, the moon, the stars, Matthew 24, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus speaks of the destruction of the temple, and then he speaks of the coming of the Son of Man. And in um, verse 29, Matthew 24, 29, Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. It's that same word that's used there in Matthew 24, that's also used in Matthew 6, 26, but it's also used again in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What Peter is saying here is that everything will be destroyed in totality. Right. Everything, as you mentioned, there will be nothing left. And this great noise that Peter talks about here, I'm not going to try to pronounce the original word, but it does mean the swish of an arrow the rumbling of thunder, the crackle of flames, the scream of a lash as it descends, uh, rushing mighty water. If you've ever been to um, Niagara Falls, it can be almost deafening on certain days. Hearing the water fall and land uh, is so loud. Uh, the hissing of a serpent. Peter used, he united several thoughts here that should make anyone feel uncomfortable. They were all very tough thoughts. If you've ever been in, been in an earthquake or re, a real bad thunderstorm and you think about the rumble of a thunder, it literally makes your house shake. And so you imagine this noise coming from heaven that would probably feel like thunder you never felt before or several earthquakes, a magnitude that we have never experienced before. Paul also talks about this. You mentioned First Thessalonians. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, also about this noise. 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, Behold, I tell you, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Right? So he used that same term, for the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ shall, raise, shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So he uses that same thing in, in, in 1 Thessalonians. Even more description Paul uses. Three phases, three pieces. It's that the descend from heaven with a shout, mm -hmm. the archangel, as you mentioned, and yes, the trumpet of God. And when we think about this idea of all the elements dissolving, one commentary I read says, Peter had no way of knowing of the atomic age to come, but he likened it. He made a connection to what an atomic bomb would do. It would completely wipe out everything. Now, but the difference between the second advent of Christ and the first destruction of the world in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, in Ge Genesis chapter 6 through 9, there was something left. There were eight souls left. There was an ark. They started over. But in this second coming, this day of the Lord, not sure there's going to be a restart here. I know we're going to read about a new heaven and a new earth in the next few verses. But everything is going to be destroyed. Everything is going to be consumed. And so Psalms 102, 25 and 26 says, of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and the works of your hands. They will perish and you will endure. So as you said, we'll be called up. The dead in Christ shall rise and we'll have that opportunity to spend eternity with Christ. And Peter goes on and say, or not just Christ, but we'll have eternity to, to be with God. Verse 11, therefore, he's given us, why is this therefore here, right? Therefore, since all these things will dissolve as what he just talked about, what manner of person ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? So how should we live in view of eternity? That's the question here. How should we live in view of eternity? Should we be working for the things that will ultimately be destroyed? The things here in this physical world? Or should we be working for the things that are eternal? Mm -hmm. Where should we be laying up our treasures, as Christ would say? We should be laying up our treasures in heaven, where moth and rust does not corrupt. 
laying up our treasures here for a world that's going to go away doesn't really get us far. And we live in a society where we're so driven by the things of the world. Mm -hmm. right? We want the creature comforts. You know, we, you know, I, my heart goes out to a brother and sister, their, their air conditioner went out and they were talking about how uncomfortable it was. And, and, and I've been there and it is uncomfortable, right? But we live sometimes for these creature comforts and I'm not speaking bad of them by any means. God has blessed us to have the ability to have air conditioning. Um, but we, we do live for the creature comforts. Uh, we want the softest chair. Uh, you want that nice recliner. We just don't buy any recliner. We shop for a recliner, mm -hmm. right? We don't want something that we, when we shop for a mattress, we don't want a mattress that's gonna be hard or springy, we shop for comfort. We put time into the things of this world. Now, Peter's challenging, he's challenging the reader here, are we putting time into the things of eternity? And are we really conducting ourselves in a godly manner? And he talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So, Tommy, I'll stop there. You want to throw some thoughts in before we go on to the rest of this verse? And again, what you're emphasizing is so true. You know, mm -hmm. we've got to remember we're just sojourners here. We're pilgrims. Mm -hmm. We're passing through. We ought to remember that simply because of the brevity of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, none of us have the promise of tomorrow. And so what we're doing here, right here, right now, uh, will make a difference in where we spend eternity. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember and, and keep always thinking about this isn't home. Home is going to be with God. Mm -hmm. I agree with you 100% in the fact that we make our homes here as comfortable as we can get them. Um, because we, we want this place where we can have a place where we can shut ourselves off from the world a little bit. I think some of us may be a little bit tired of being shut away from the world for a little while because of the pandemic. But at the same time, we've always got a place where we, we call home where we can just, just, you know, sit back, be ourselves instead of trying to be everything that everybody wants us to be. And we do want it to be very comfortable. And, and again, there's something to be said about that. Okay. God's blessed us with those abilities to do that. But let's always remember, and again, I think it's what Dwayne pointed out, and I, I'm trying to bring out as well, is that what really matters is our relationship with God. And what really matters is where we're going to spend eternity. I may have a, a $2 million uh, library, you know what I'm saying? All that stuff's going to burn up one of these days. I may have the best computer on the market. And it's going to be gone. All that's going to be on that day is going to be my relationship with God and, you know, I think our relationship with the loved ones that we have here on this earth, that's going to change too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because in other passages, Jesus will talk about the fact that there's neither marriage nor giving in marriage. So there's going to be a lot of changes there. That's going to be so different from what we know here. Mm -hmm. And again, and that's why he's stressing the idea, since all this is going to be dissolved, let's think about our conduct. Let's always think about the idea of every duty that we have as Christians to teach others the gospel, to help others whenever they're in need, to be living in godliness in every way we can. You know, Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, we do not look at the things that are seen, but of the things that are not seen for the things that are temporary or seen or temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And it's kind of takes a little more imagination to see things that are eternal, but that's where the Bible comes in. And as Paul and as Peter and these others are trying to describe what it's going to be like, as Jesus tried to describe it in Matthew 24 and 25 with the destruction of Jerusalem and then the destruction of the world, uh, it, it, we can't really wrap our minds around it. But what we have to do is make sure that again, we have our focus on the eternal, not the temporary. And that's what I think he goes on and brings out in verse 12, that we need to look for and hasten the coming of the day of God in which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter is challenging us in this verse 
to look forward to the Lord's coming. Perhaps because we've been through some hard times lately because of the pandemic and so forth, looking forward to heaven is easier, right? But the danger comes a lot of times whenever things are going very well in this life and we get to the point to where we think, well, I'm pretty comfortable now. I've got what I want. I'm watching my TV shows. I, you know, I've got plenty to eat and on and on and on we go and talk about the material things of this life. And the bottom line is, is that we lose sight of heaven. And that's why he emphasized we need to look forward to it. We need to earnestly desire heaven, not just when things are bad, but when things are good. And that's it. This will signal the end of all of our earthly trials. Well, boy, that sounds great, right? That, that's a good idea. And so we sigh. We, we earnestly desire. It's, the King James says it's hastening unto. It's the idea of, you know, we, we're trying to hasten God's coming. Think about that for a minute. How many of us really hasten? How many of us really want the Lord to come in our lifetime? You know, that's, that's it. Are, 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 my, am I, am I, are my actions going to help the God's kingdom to come sooner? Or is God having to wait on me because of my failings and shortcomings to where he's putting off what he wants to do? And again, we've got to remember that he's going to come whenever he's, his, his day is ready. But there seems to be the suggestion that, again, we, we, he's going to come when he wants to, but what if, what if he's holding off because he's waiting for us to get our act together? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a sobering thought to me. Mm-hmm. Um, brother, <laughs> your thoughts? I just want to share something I came across. People who will not believe in the second coming of Christ and the accompanying judgment of the world inevitably have a tendency to live carelessly and they live sinful lives. There is a positive and definite connection between one, uh, but what one believes and what one does. There's a connection between what you believe and what you do. Mm-hmm. And what you believe will reflect in what you do. Mm-hmm. And if you believe of a second coming, then you are, as Paul would say, thinking on the things eternal. Right? Mm-hmm. You're trying to focus on the things eternal and not on the physical. But if, if the second coming doesn't mean that to you, then you're probably going to do the things that are careless and live sinful lives. Mm-hmm. Because you have no idea and no connection to the eternal. And so therefore you're not living according to the eternal. And I agree with everything you said, well, we should earnestly desire this, but why would we earnestly desire it? And you touched on this. We're looking forward to being restored totally and completely. The the pains and aches of this life restored. Separation from loved ones who have gone on restored. What's the greatest restoration? To be back with God eternally we're restored that's why we earnestly look and desire the coming of god Mm -hmm. now none of us really know what that day is going to be like we have some descriptions you know and we've talked about it there's going to be a great noise a shout the archangel the trumpet thunder and the whistling of like the wind and the, the whistling of an arrow we we have all of that and i would have to believe that some of that's going to cause us to tremble some of that's going to shock us and make us shake in our shoes. That's right. Even those of the Lord, those who have lived, you know, lived righteously, because it's going to be something so powerful that we probably have never experienced or seen. It's going to shake us to some degree, mm-hmm. but we look forward to it, right? And as Paul said, those who are alive will be called up. They'll be caught up. And that, that's the day that we look forward to, to be caught up and brought back and restored with God. So I just wanted to kind of throw those thoughts out there. I totally agree with everything you said. Um, and Peter says that, you know, again, he just reiterates what he's been saying, because of which the heavens will dissolve 
being on fire and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. There will be what we know and see now will be no more. That's right. Will be no more. Kind of going. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead, because I was going to move on. I don't want to preach my sermon now that I'm going to preach later on, but it's interesting in light of that, that one of the things that Paul does in First Thessalonians is he's talking about in chapter four, the necessity for Christians to be pure. pure. Mm -hmm. He's gonna talk about the sexual immorality. And again, we think of 1 Corinthians five, and we think about how he's dealt with this in every one of his books. Mm -hmm. And he made a statement that had never really, you know, I kind of glossed over a lot of times. He said, don't you defraud or, or, or take advantage of a brother, right. you know, in, in that respect. And it's kind of like, wow, uh, you know, so obviously Paul was trying to encourage them to faithful Christian living, mm -hmm. living faithful Christian lives every day. And then he starts talking about the Lord's coming. Here's the motive. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the motive for me to be living a more godly? And one of the key words that we will talk a lot about tomorrow is the idea. What's the, what's the motive for me to live a holy life? Here it is. It's the Lord's coming. He says, you know what? You don't know when he's going to come. So make sure whenever he comes that you're ready. I remember growing up whenever my dad was about to get home every day from work, I had to make sure I had everything done and he wanted me to get done. Otherwise mm -hmm. there would have been some stuff to pay. You, you know, what I'm trying to say. there would have been, uh, there would have been discussions or, or worse than that, you, you know, uh, so the bottom line, I think about it is, is we don't want to be caught unaware. Right. We need to be ready. And, and I think that's a very important thing to stress as we look at this and I'll stress it again tomorrow, but, mm -hmm. or today, later on today, you know, depending on when you look at the video, we get into the details of the new heavens and the new earth and all that other stuff. But what Peter and Paul both is emphasizing is always be ready, mm -hmm. always. Always. So I think we'll close on this next verse. We'll close out on verse 13. We'll talk about verse 13 and we'll wrap up for today. And I know there's a lot of commentary out here on verse 13. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna cover every angle of this, but I think you kind of summed it up very well that in light of the returning day, or the day of the Lord, how are we living our lives? Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what this new heaven, this new earth, and what all what God has in store for that particular new heaven and new. We don't know what that is, and mm -hmm. many people have argued and argued about what that is. Uh, Isaiah does make reference to a new earth. Isaiah sixty five seventeen. Mm -hmm. Isaiah says, "For behold, I create new heavens and new earths, and the former shall not be remembered." or come to mind, which is where Peter's probably quoting from. And, and if you continue on in Isaiah, uh, reading verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. It's God's plan. It's not man's plan what this new heaven, this new earth will be. Isaiah also tells us that his ways are not our ways. His ways are above our ways of thinking, beyond what we can even imagine or perceive or give thought to. So I, I'm challenged when, when we, you know, I read so much inventory out there <laughs> about what that interpretation of this new earth and this new heaven would be. But whatever it is, we know it's going to be beautiful if God has his hand. It's going to be God's work, not ours. And whatever he has in store for us, I can only imagine it's going to be something we cannot wrap our minds around. Right. But when we continue to read in Isaiah um, chapter 65, I want to skip down to verse 23. There, there should be no more vain. There should be no more labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And to be called one of God's children, one of his blessed, to be brought into his, 
his eternal, everlasting resting place. That's all I need. Amen. Amen. That's all I need. Amen. And so in, in view of that, then I need to live according to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As we all should. That's right. You've also got the idea of Revelation 21.1, where that idea yeah. of the new heaven and new earth is mentioned. Yes. Isaiah 66 ends the book, Isaiah 66.22, yeah. with the phrase, the new heavens and the new earth. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the original languages, you had the idea of the ideal of new in two different mm -hmm. sentences. Number one, mm -hmm. the ideal of young versus old, okay? Uh, a new baby uh, versus an old person, <laughs> you know, something along that line. And then the other one is talking about the, that which is fresh as opposed to that which is worn out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this earth is going to be worn out. And so we're going to have a whole new place. And I'm like you, Dwayne, we don't again even begin to understand what it's going to be like. Um, there are some things we can know from what we can figure out from what the Bible says about this. Mm -hmm. Um, the new heaven and the new earth is going to happen after the destruction of the old heaven and the old earth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that means the earth that is then will not be this one. Some people talk about the idea of God doing a recap job. You know what I'm talking? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that years ago, especially during the 30s and 40s, whenever rubber was so rare, they would try to recap a tire to make it work. So some people think about that. There's one particular religious group that emphasizes that a lot, that God's going to recap this world. And they use that term new in the idea that it's not uh, old, but it's new, that God's going to redo it. But the word here, as I said, is, is that which is fresh in contrast to something that's worn out. So you also understand uh, number three, as you think about it, and there's no hint of a crane of Christ on this earth. A lot of people do say he's going to come and live on this earth and reign as the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Mm -hmm. And multiplied forests have been killed for the paper to propagate that particular doctrine where the Lord is going to set up his kingdom here in the city of Jerusalem. And a lot of people will even go. And that was interesting this last week. I was reading in the book of Ezekiel where he talks about uh, this same vision or this idea of 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 God rebuilding Jerusalem, and that's where the prince, as he would call him in the book of Ezekiel, is going to reign and live. And, and you know, but what's also interesting is Ezekiel also talks about the reinstitution of the animal sacrifices. And I'm like, why in the world is, why, if, if this is going to be a literal place, why does the Lord need to reinstitute these animal sacrifices again? He died on the cross. That took care of all of that. And so the thing that they'll jump to a lot of passages of scripture to try to justify it. Yeah. And we have to be very careful again, that we're looking at it from a, a Bible wide context instead of just trickling at, at, at yep. specific passages and trying to make them mean what we want them to mean. So mm -hmm. we have to be very careful about that. Another thing that we realize that when the day of the Lord does come again, we look in the book of first Corinthians 15 where he talks about the resurrection in detail, but he also gives us some clues here. And, and I know that we're getting very close to the end of time, but I just want to just read this passage to you a little bit, uh, beginning in verse, um, uh, 20, we're going to try to go through verse 28. Christ is risen from the dead has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for sin by, for since by man, came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead as an Adam all die even so in Christ all shall be made alive um, each in his own order Christ the first fruits afterward those who are Christ at his coming now notice there he's talking about the coming then the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he Christ puts all an end to all rule and all authority and all power for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. When he said, for he has put all things under his feet, he said all things are put under him. It is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the son himself will also be made subject to him who 
put things, all things under him, and that Christ or God may be all in all. So this passage emphasizes the idea that there's going to be a judgment day. Jesus is going to judge the world, judge all the kingdoms of men, and then he is actually going to deliver the kingdom up to the Father and so that God may be all in all, which is what was planned from the very beginning of time. So he's not going to set up an earthly kingdom on this earth. He's not going to do it with a recap job. There's no proof in this passage that it suggests that idea. And so this does suggest the idea, and again, that this is just a, this earth is a figure a shadow of what we've got to look forward to. The main thing that I think is important, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm trying to say this as quickly as I can, but the main thing that I want to see is important is that as you look at these descriptions, the main thing is that we're with God. We are with God. Heaven is the final abode of the people of God with God forever and ever. So the word, I think, heaven, new heavens and new earth is talking about the final designation of what we call heaven, not where the birds are and the storms are, but where God is. Yes. And that's what God has wanted since the fall back in Genesis chapter three. Very good. I totally agree. I totally <laughs> agree. This is not our home. We're passing through. Uh, we all should be looking forward to being with God in heaven. But in the meantime, how are we living our lives? Amen. So that is the best thing that we can encourage everyone who's listening and tuning in. How are you living your life? How am I living my life? And are we living in view of eternity? Amen. And, and, and if, that's, if I can close with that, then we'll close with that. I'll have a word of prayer and then we'll wrap it up. Sounds good. Let's bro. pray. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word for it.